We have been offering this lectureship since 1987 to emphasize, to remind ourselves as a community of our commitment to holiness. We've had such interesting speakers, a variety of fields represented in our speakers over the years, and I'm honored to have Di Dr. David Fitch here uh, today. Um, I'll read his official bio if you don't know David, and then I'll make a couple of personal comments. David Fitch is the B.R. Lind Lindner Chair of Evangelical Theology at Northern Seminary in Chicago, founding pastor of Life on the Vine Christian Community. So we love the combination of pastor-scholar. He coaches a network of church plants in the Christian and Missionary Alliance uh, tradition linked to Life on the Vine. He writes on issues of the local church, the local church and mission, including cultural engagement, leadership, and theology, lectured and presented on these topics at many seminaries, graduate schools, denominational gatherings, and conferences. I, I first met David through his book, The Great Giveaway, which was uh, very encouraging, eye-opening, challenging, but also encouraging at the way he was uh, helping the church think about our, our mission and our identity. The church of which I'm a part today is using his book, uh, Faithful Presence, as sort of a guiding philosophy, guiding ministry philosophy. And so um, I'm honored that he could be here to share two lectures with us. We will have a time of question and answer when David is finished with this lecture and the evening lecture. So be thinking of questions. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite students to ask the first questions if you're, if you're ready, students, because we faculty members, we love to talk, but I want to I want to give the students space. So please, students, be thinking of some questions that you might ask David. Would you welcome Dr. David Fitch? <laughs> Greetings, everyone from Chicago. The uh, it's not as cold as you you people in California think it is. <laughs> uh, and I love it, but it's an honor to be invited here uh, to do this. You know, um, thanks to all of you who who got me here. Uh, I have uh, wanted to explore uh, several ideas for a while that have been kind of coming together in, in my various interactions as a church pastor, professor, and thinker through the cultural issues that we're facing today. And so uh, I, this is my first stab. So a uh, quick alert. I am open to any and all challenges and questions. Um, I'm going to be uh, dealing a lot with James Cone and interpreting him here famous black liberation theologian. If you need to challenge me, please do. Let's talk about this together because it, it, will, it will make us better. It'll allow Jesus to work in the room. Amen? Amen. And, uh, and it will help my work as well. So anyways, here we go. Um, the question is this. When the church discerns social moral decisions presented to it by the culture, Things like racism, sexuality, gender, socioeconomic structures of poverty. Should we look to be on the right side of history or on the wrong side of power? So that's my big question. Are we looking to be on the right side of history? Does that help us discern God, what he's doing, where he's taking us? Or I want to contend now. Actually, I think we need to be on the side of power where God is working. That's where we shall discern, where God is at work. So in the first lecture, I want to make this basic argument that if we would discern how to engage culture for the sake of God's salvation in the world through Christ, we must discern it by being on the wrong side of worldly power, not on the right side of history. And then I want to show how, um, uh, this is in tonight's lecture. This is a little dangerous for me. Uh, I want to show how reformed theology, or, uh, a theology often ensconced in Euro-Christendom forms of Christianity has led us astray. Amen. And it's going to take the holiness people Amen. to get us back on the right track. I just went into my preaching voice <laughs> for just a few seconds. Um, then I'll make some final comments tonight. If any of you show up, 
uh, to illustrate these arguments with some comments on how this idea applies to the current Protestant evangelical church in the United States as it has engaged the Trump administration and the sexuality issues of our day. So I am sure, by the way, for anybody taking notes, I am not a member of uh, Azusa Pacific University. I come from Chicago, so don't blame APU for this, okay? Can I have another amen? amen. All right, okay, so let's get started. Um, being on the right side of history, it's been part of the mainstream moral vocabularies for the past several decades. Um, it perhaps reached its zenith with President Obama, who in an address to the nation, addressing terrorism, this is like in 2015, uh, he closed it with these words, my fellow Americans, I am confident we will succeed in this mission because we are on the right side of history. Um, according to David Graham of The Atlantic, Obama used the phrase right side of history or wrong side of history 28 times during his presidency. Um, famously in, in President Obama's address at Chicago's Grand Park. You know President Obama is from <laughs> Chicago. Okay, just so you knew that. Uh, he, the night he was elected, he used this phrase again in his second inaugural address, saying the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And that phrase, by the way, was popularized by Martin Luther King, who was using it off of an abolitionist man named Theodore Parker. Um, but he used the right side of history um, as a primary moral argument for pursuing justice in the world. But this phrase, right side of history, has been part of our moral modern vocabulary before uh, the Obama administration. President Clinton used it. President Reagan used it. Uh, they were very prone to using it in their speeches. Even going further back, an Oxford historian named Herbert Butterfield in 1931 wrote a book titled The Whig Interpretation of History outlining how the right side of history argument uh, is basically used as the means of those in power to seize the moral high ground. In the preface of that book, he said, the tendency in many historians is to write the side of Protestants and Whigs to praise revolutions provided they have been successful to emphasize certain principles in progress in the past and to produce a story which is the ratification, if not the glorification, of the present. The right side of history argument um, has been used by those in power to keep themselves in power. Um, the right side of history moral argument has been part of modern Protestantism for a hundred years. Uh, the influences of Hegel and Marx and their views of history have underpinned the argument. I don't think I want to go too deep into that, but the dialectical progress of history within, within materialism was a big theme, and that plays into this idea that we need to get on the right side of history. Walter Rauschenbusch, a famed uh, social gospel theologian, viewed history also in this vein. Uh, for Rauschenbusch, the kingdom of God had entered history in Jesus. The church works to cooperate with bringing of the whole world towards the telos of the historical processes set loose in the kingdom by Jesus. And so uh, Rauschenbusch called this the Christianizing of the social order. The right side of history, it's been an argument that's been around and carried a lot of moral currency in our culture. This moral argument has been popularized and criticized. I, I even think perhaps at this point it's been overused. But here's where I find the, this moral argument, right side of history, most often still in currency, still being used. This is especially true, I say, 
when it comes to the moral assessment of the church. So hear me out on this. I, 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 I'm, I'm looking at you right now. I'm, I'm trying to find if you agree with this. There is a broad popular consensus today that the church has generally failed to be on the right side of the great moral issues of history. When we think of slavery, racism, anti-Semitism, colonialism, the subjection, subjugation of women. We see evidence throughout the church's history in the West of all the church's complicity with some of the worst evils in Western civilization. All these evils, it is argued, have been defended by the church, even using scripture. Over time, the progress in history, liberal democracy, we have seen progress in achieving these goals of equal rights, emancipation from slavery and other various oppressions. The Christian church, it is argued, has resisted all these movements early on. And it was always coming late to be on the right side of these issues. So I have to engage. So when I'm in the streets, when I'm on the trains, or when I'm talking to people in places I hang out that are not Christian places, I get this argument all the time. The church has always been on the wrong side of history. It's always late. Few can debate that the church always seems to be on the wrong side of these issues. And so today, there seems to be True, this seems to be true of maybe the church's stance on LGBTQ sexuality. And so debatable as the moral argument may be, there is a part of the right side of history argument that endures. It says the church is perennially stuck. I might be over, I feel like I might be overemphasizing this. This is the moral weight I feel in, my, in the cultures of, my, of where I live. This is the kind of thing, I got a 14-year-old son, this is the kind of thing he's engaging, just sitting in a geography class in ninth grade. It says the church is perennial, perennial, perennially stuck in conservative, slow stances, slow to discern the moral call of the universe. By the way, is there a clock somewhere that I can keep track of myself? No? Okay, where's my phone? Okay, I don't have it. Anyways. So if I go along, uh, tonight I'll have my phone. Um, today we hear cries of women calling out men for rampant sexual abuse they've experienced. Stunningly, the Southern Baptist Convention, the Roman Catholic Church, has been involved in covering up sexual abuse against women, against children. The Me Too movement has turned to a Church Too movement. And many of us shudder at the various church organizations as they scurry to defend themselves. The church, once again, seems to be on the wrong side of history. <clears throat> this uh, argument seems almost unchallengeable on a popular level. Nonetheless, okay, now I'm into my next section. Nonetheless, here's an alternative analysis. I want to propose an alternative analysis to the wrong side, right side of history argument that I think better explains what actually happened in the past regarding the church's history of complicity with injustices, slavery, racism, women, social economics of poverty, with the hope that maybe this might give us a better guide and practice for discerning the issues in the future, or today's present struggle over politics in the United States, or the church's engagement with alternative sexualities in the current cultural climate. A closer look, I suggest, uh, at history is not that it, it's not that in the progress in history that we should look for the moral guide, 
but rather whenever the church aligns itself with worldly power, whether it be wealth, government coercion, war, hierarchy, this has almost for sure portended that we're on the wrong side of the concurring moral discernments. Did you all get that? I am saying maybe it's the issue of the church's complicity with power, worldly power, that predicts when we're on the wrong side. Allow me to define worldly power. I'm going to use James Davison Hunter's definition of power in his book, To Change the World, only because a lot of people seem to like it, which I don't, but it's generally accepted. Hunter defines power as asymmetrical. Power is power when it is power over someone or something. It's the ability to have or control resources. Someone, some groups, some institutions, Hunter says, will always have more capacity to act than others. Indeed, part of their power is the capacity to deprive others of the ability to act or accumulate. He says, quote, human relations are inherently power relations. He says it's ubiquitous. It's unavoidable in human relations. I want to challenge this, by the way, in the next lecture, tonight's lecture. I want to challenge it. But for now, this is my definition of worldly power. Any coercion, including violence or the use of resources, the ability to control over someone unilaterally, with or without physical violence, is what I wish to describe as worldly power. This power is often associated with government, military, and other political organizations. And of course, this kind of power can be used benevolently for good. Its presence, though, and abuse in churches, it is in churches everywhere, and corporations, and capitalist enterprises. In, in tonight's lecture, I'm going to talk about the flattened view of power, and that we do not have an imagination for any other kind of power in the United States of America. And it's this reason why we're always defaulting to this power. But that's tonight. I keep making small little commercials for tonight. I contend that when the church aligns itself with worldly power, it finds itself compromised to the point where it makes poor, almost always wrong discernments regarding God's work in the world. But whenever the church has historically been present to the poor, distant, present to the disenfranchised, taken the posture of listening to the hurting, and discerned what God is doing there, where whenever this is the starting point, it has almost, off, almost always been on the side of what God is doing in history. In essence, you know, as we face these dilemmas today, we should not be asking whether we're on the right side of history. We should be asking, are we on the right side of power or the wrong side of worldly power? <clears throat> Interestingly, as an aside, when we, when we hear the church needs to get on the right side of power, and when it comes to the issue of slavery, we say, often we say, that there is a power, a power move going on in this statement. Well, you need, you need to get on the right side of power. But there's a power move going on in that statement itself. So, so for to say the church was on the wrong side of ish, history in regard to slavery is to say the white church, the inheritor of economic and class power, was on the wrong side of history. It's almost like saying they're the only church that counts, ignoring that the black church was emerging during the same time, very much fighting for justice, using the same scriptures that the white wealthy churches in power were using to justify slavery, to argue for liberation. Indeed, what we discover often is that the right side of history argument is really a subtle narration used 
to argue for a version of history which keeps the existing power in power. I, I, I sense the Holy Spirit. No, I shouldn't make that light. But anyways, I do sense, I do feel something with that. So uh, I, I do recognize this idea is not novel. There have been many versions of uh, this idea. Uh, the ideas that I am uh, tracking with you here are thick. They run thick within certain Anabaptist radical reformation traditions of the church. But what I want to do now here is suggest how even when there is an acknowledgement of this basic principle, still because we have no understanding that power works in any other way, the church tends to default into worldly power. We need an imagination for the way God works. We need an imagination for the way God's presence works in the world. I want to illustrate this theme first as it works itself out within liberation theology. Then I'll go to the work of, uh, of well, I'll start with James Cohn, and then I'll go to Jamar Tisby, and then I'll talk about Don Dayton's historiography of holiness evangelicalism. In each case, the principle is illustrated that it is when the church is aligned with the rich, the powerful, government, its moral discernment is lost. When it postures itself among the disenfranchised, the poor, the church ends up cooperating with God. But in each case as well, we learn that the failure to distinguish between world power and God's power leads to, I would say, an eventual capitulation to worldly power. And that's where I feel like we're in in so many ways, in so many situations with the church in the United States of America. So let me just talk a little bit about James Cohn here for a little bit. Has anybody got a watch I can just use for, for uh, can I just use it up here? Well, yeah, that's that's going to go on and off though, isn't it? Anything to, if you didn't push that. The, the clock oh, okay. Off. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, all right, I'm going to have to, I just saw the time here, and I'm going to have to rush this a little bit, but that's okay. The question of posture as a point of discernment in relation to power has been the animating force for, for a lot of theological developments in the last 150 years, but most notably, the idea of the relationship between power and discernment has been the driver in liberation theology movement. Now, I don't have to go through, uh, I can't go through all of liberation theology. I'm just going to focus a little bit on James Cone. But uh, there has been described at, at various times in these various movements the idea of the preferential option or the epistemological privilege of the poor. This is the idea, in the words of Mujerista theologian Ada Maria Isasi Diaz, that the marginalized, quote, can see and understand what the rich and the privileged cannot. It is not that the poor and the oppressed are morally superior or that they can see better. Their epistemological privilege is based on the fact that because their point of view is based on the fact that because of their point of view is not distorted by power and riches, they can see things differently. So here we have within the hardwiring of liberation theology a theological method which asserts that the church discerns who God is and what he's doing by not discerning the right side of history, as seen from a privileged vantage point, but rather by being on the wrong side of worldly power. James Cone is a premier example of this in his work. His starting point is also this, this version of the epistemological privileged position of being among the marginalized in a dominant society. In his opening methodological chapter in God of the Oppressed, intro, after the intro chapter, he says, there is no truth in Jesus Christ independent of the oppressed, of the land, their history, their culture. And in America, the oppressed are the people of color, black, yellow, red, and brown. Indeed, it can be said that to know Jesus is to know him 
as revealed in the struggle of the oppressed for freedom. Cohn argues for various sources of theological authority, but ultimately he says we must begin with presence in the black experience, the plight of the oppressed. And so a, a prototype statement of Cohn's is found in his book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, where he says God was present with Jesus on the cross and thereby refused to let Satan and death have the last word. God was also present in every lynching. So he says there is an opening to the transcendent here in the crosses of the suffering. So for Cohn, there's a unique and searing perspective of God in and among the poor. There are, quote, concrete signs of divine presence in the lives of the poor. When Cohn talks about the liberating power of black experience, he's talking about the power of presence, relational power of God's presence at work in the world. Over and over again, he talks about the problem of distance, the power, the problem of distance that comes from power over he talks about the posture of white supremacy that blinds even his own colleagues at Union Seminary from seeing and understanding God at work in the justice of the world. So once again, right side of history argument is superseded by what side of power are we on? How are we going to discern what God is doing? Okay, now let me talk about Jamar Tisby. Uh, Jamar is a uh, his young, younger historian. Uh, wrote a book last year, The Color of Compromise. It's not a theological book, but um, it illustrates the methodological issue I'm arguing for here. Um, so one of his contentions is white complicity with racism isn't a matter of melanin, it's a matter of power. That's a quote. Whether society is stratified according to class, gender, religion, or tribe, communities tend to put power in the hands of a few to the detriment of many. In the United States, power runs along color lines, and white people have the most influence. So Tisby works to show how several Christian church leaders who started out moderate, this is in the history of, of uh, both uh, Protestantism in the United States, they started out moderate towards slavery, meaning they worked for the chastening of the whores, if not the entire abolition of slavery in the 18th century, but somehow, over time, turned towards accepting and even endorsing slavery. Same people. So we have the example of George Whitfield, who, under the influence of Wesley, excori quote, excoriated enslavers for the way they treated slaves, preaching among the lower classes in North America. Revivals broke out, and Whitfield became a critic of the practice of slavery in America. But then Tisby describes Whitfield's critique morphs, changes. Spurred by Wesley, Whitfield built what became the Bethsaida Orphanage in Savannah, Georgia, a noble cause. But it could not be sustained financially, and so it bordered on financial ruin. Whitfield joined with some wealthy allies in South Carolina to keep it going. They bought land. They started a plantation and hoped to sustain the orphanage through the profits of the plantation. The plantation, however, struggled to make a profit. To compete, the plantation required slaves to make it profitable. And so stunningly, Whitfield became a leader in petitioning the state legislator of, legislature of Georgia, free territory, to allow slavery. Aligning with the forces of money-making and power, shaped the famed revivalist to lose his ability to discern God and is working to overcome slavery. Jonathan Edwards. Another case is in Tisby's litany of church failures. He asks, why did Jonathan Edwards support slavery? In part, he suggests the answer may have to do with his social status. Wealthy and influential people populated his congregation. Slave owning, owning signified status. The evangelicalism of Jonathan Edwards focused on individual conversion and piety so it could avoid the questions and issues of social systems. But you know, it was Jonathan Edwards' son 
John Edwards Jr., who grew up amongst Mohican and Mohawk tribes and spoke their languages better than English, who became the abolitionist. In an unmistakable way, it was the one whose posture was among the marginalized who refused status, who discerned who God is and what he's doing in the world. Tisby details how John Wesley himself found slavery appalling. Although he was far from advocating racial equality, his anti-slavery stance, along with his emphasis on revivalism, interracial camp meetings, a swift ordination process, and an appeal to non-elite classes initially attracted black Christians. But as the denomination grew, reached up into higher echelons of establishment wealth and power, it became socially conservative. Tisby details the splits that happened among the Methodists and the Baptists 100 years after the Great Awakening revivals. The South, where money power was aligned with slavery, became the center of pro-slavery justifications among Christians. The North, where because of industrialization, slavery had become a non-issue for the economic power, the churches became anti-slavery. This led to a split in denominations. And so one can say the posture of each church's location vis-a-vis -vis economic power led to its response to social justice of slavery. Slavery in the South, both among Methodists and Baptists, became justified, not because they were on the wrong side of history, but because they were on the wrong side of power. The Southern Baptists and Methodists ended up failing to discern God and his work in the world, but likewise, one might ponder where, whether the North became anti-slavery in a way still aligned to economic power, which led to the catastrophic violence of war as the only solution to the problem. In chapter 9, I've got 10 more minutes here, folks. Can you hang with me? Chapter 9, Jamar Tisby locates the origins of today's religious right and its alignment of white evangelicalism with Billy Graham and his relationship with Richard Nixon and the beginnings of the Southern, quote, Southern strategy. This strategy sought to develop certain law and order policies to appeal to white voters who were afraid of movements to integrate the black peoples of America with the white peoples of America. Once again, for Tisby, it's the subtle alignment with worldly power that pollutes the judgments of Christians to see what God is doing. Um, in tonight's lecture, I want to talk about how reformed theology flattens power. And strangely, Jamar is reformed. And I would, does anyone know Jamar's new book? He spoke here last week in chapel. I missed him by a week. OK, glad he's not here from what I'm about to say. Strangely, Jamar, a historian, out of his reformed lineage, can't see uh, how he's locked into a flattened view of power. He sees it a continual absorption of the issue. And if we just use power rightly, or at least, Jamar, if you're listening, at least uh, let me explain that tonight, and I'll justify what I just said. <laughs> OK. <clears throat> Anyways, um, one more person to go through, and, and then uh, I hope I've made my case so we can have a good discussion. Thirdly and lastly, I'd like to highlight the work of church historian Don Dayton. Dayton famously wrote a series of articles in the mid-'70s for what became uh, Sojourners magazine. And in this, uh, it became a book called uh, uh, discovering an evangelical heritage. And in this book, Dayton argues the true origins of what became the evangelical movement were the revivalists, and actually the holiness revivalists, of the late 1800s. And these revivalists were no Princetonians who argued for inerrancy for the Bible, but the holiness revivalists who ministered and advocated among the poor. So he gives several examples of this, like for one, Wheaton College, which is not too far away while it's on the western edge of Chicago. It's a symbol of modern day evangelicalism. Uh, it was actually saved from financial ruin by Jonathan Blanchard, an avowed abolitionist. And this, this was a Wesleyan school, Wesleyan Methodist, founded on abolitionist commitments, among others, and accepted Blanchard warmly and um, in one of the most famous of these campaigns, representing the Cincinnati Abolition Society, 
uh, he, debating a gradualist, uh, a gradualist is someone who says slavery's bad, but we gotta work out of it so it doesn't disrupt things. Uh, he was to be remembered as one always faithful to the poor. Blanchard lived and worked always from a posture among the poor. We might say today that he was on the right side of history, but the better explanation is he was discerning God from the posture of being among the poor. In the same way, uh, Dayton details uh, Charles Finney, who left the auspices of old school Presbyterian at Princeton to start what uh, Dayton calls New School Presbyterianism at Oberlin College. According to Dayton, Finney rejected going to Princeton Theological Seminary and turned to the lower classes. His churches in New York were known for their free pews and welcoming the poor. This led later to an embracing of a more radical form of revivalism, an amalgamation with the emerging holiness movement and an adoption of anti-hierarchical social philosophy. Dayton detail, by the way, that's the Bible. Uh, anti-hierarchical social philosophy would be the Bible. Okay, but I'm quoting Don from Scholars Review. Dayton detailed how these new school Presbyterians were the Methodist party of Presbyterianism. The new measures of Finney's revivalism were largely drawn from Methodist practices. From this came one of the greatest abolitionist movements of the pre-Civil War period. Not only did Oberlin become the hotbed of abolitionism, but spurred on and trained many new leaders, including Theodore Weld and Blanchard. Once again, now there are complexities. There are mixed motivations. There is still enduring racism among these abolitionists. I was with Don Dayton yesterday uh, at his uh, uh, retirement home, and he was telling me about Robert Allen. You know, Robert Allen, he actually was his roommate, I guess, at Columbia. Um, black scholar, once uh, head of the Black Scholar Journal, uh, who wrote this book, Reluctant Reformers, talking about the mixed motivations of many abolitionists, in case you're interested. But once again, there are complexities here, yes, but their trajectory towards abolition rejected the existing culture of power and led the way on abolitionism. And they did this from a posture among the poor. They were on, not on the right side of history, they were taking the right posture towards worldly power, which is against it. Dayton details how early Methodism had been characterized by vigorous opposition to slavery, and yet struggles began among the Methodists at large, among those who feared anarchy. Others became aligned with economic interests in the South, and yet it was still Orange Scott and then later Luther Lee, both raised in lower class poverty, who became the leaders of the Wesleyan Methodist movement, who stayed firm in their convictions and leadership in the abolition of slavery. In other words, they started among the poor. In other words, it wasn't like they were hopping on a train with the right side of history. They were able to, to discern what God is doing by being on the, on the right side of power, the, the wrong side of worldly power, uh, uh, posture among the poor. There's much more to uh, Dayton's work here, but he basically outlines how it was holiness movements, the revivals, indeed the Pentecostal movements among the poor where the work of abolition for slavery, the emancipation of women, the work of alleviating poverty, some of these groups you might know, Salvation Army, the Nazarenes, Free Methodists, Wesleyan Methodists, Christian Missionary Alliance, that's my own denomination, and many, many more, and we shall see there were, of course, many mixed motives. But in all these cases, there was a decided presence among the poor that enabled a push towards righteousness in all these various issues. So, give me one more. Okay, I've got three more minutes. Perhaps the most interesting part of this for me is Dayton repeatedly, repetitively through numerous articles, shows how almost all these holiness movements almost naturally uh, cultivated improved economics. People got, you know, out of alcoholism. People 
started actually relating to people better. Uh, families held together and their socioeconomic status went up. And they went from the lower strata of society to being on the, among the middle and upper classes. Um, Dayton calls this the embourgeoisment of evangelicalism. And so in each case, we see churches moving from the wrong side of worldly power to be, in essence, aligned with it. In Dayton's words, discipline and a reordered lifestyle enabled converts to rise in social class and economic level, a process culminating in the middle class church, like those against which the movement originally protested. This new church subtly transformed into a bastion against those who would threaten its life, especially the lower classes that were once the source of its vitality. The church that was once postured among the poor on the wrong side of history is now on the same side of worldly power. And the results are a disaster for the church. Dayton, uh, if you have the time, you should read it. Dayton explores the difference between Charles Hodge and Princeton's old capitals, which for long periods of time supported slavery institutionally worked against women in leadership. And Charles Finney, the abolitionist, an avid supporter of women's suffrage and women in leadership and ministry, he ends up saying how the evangelicalism holiness movements, including Finney's, were replaced by the influence of Princetonian Calvinist thought through the modernist controversies where this guy named B.B. Warfield came up with a defense of scripture and now we went, we turned Calvinist. They're the bad guys in this story. <laughs> close, just to close this lecture, I've argued that the church's story of being on the wrong side of history on issues of slavery, racism, women's rights, poverty, are really instances of the church being aligned with worldly power, being on the wrong side of worldly power. That actually, whenever we find the church present and postured with the poor, the marginalized, the oppressed, the church has often led the way in overturning these injustices. These ministries, these churches, these theologians, these leaders who lived among the marginalized, the poor, they listened, they were present, they shared life with the marginalized, ministered with and worshipped with the poor. This, I contend, shaped the way they discerned God's work, His righteousness, his work in the world. The church, on the other hand, has often failed to do it, discern God's work when it goes on the wrong side of power. Matthew uh, chapter 25 tells the parable of the sheep and the goats and the final judgment. Uh, Jesus says, the king says to those on the right hand, come, O blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. This is, of course, the posture of the church being rightly aligned with the poor and being on the wrong side of power. A little later in verse 40, he says, When you gave the cup of water to the least of these, you were giving it to me. That was me there in the midst. So Jesus is saying, I believe, that he was there. He was present there at work in the social space of being with the poor, the hurting, the marginalized. And this, in fact, defines the church. Those who received the kingdom, those who were not in that posture, to those who were not in that posture, he says, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire. So in essence, and I'm going to close with this, it's not only the church who's rightly postured towards worldly power that can discern Christ's presence at work in the world. It is more than that. The church that is not rightly postured towards worldly power, by definition, is no longer the church. They are those cursed and apart from God. Tonight, I hope to address... Uh, how we got into this mess, flattened power, and maybe some, some ways of getting out of it. Tonight, 6 o'clock. Okay, I think we have time for talking about this.
Thank you, David. Let me ask if there are students that have questions. We'll start with students and other guests before I turn back to um, professors. Cliff, I'm going to bring the mic to you. Hello, Professor. Thank you for that lecture. Um, uh, my uh, general question is, uh, how do we deal with those who want to be on the right side of power, God power, or godly power, um, when they still feel the shame and the guilt of uh, being involved or, or having the world say that they're responsible for racism, sexism, mm -hmm. so forth and so on. That's my question. Oh, that's a great question. And you're, you're saying it as a black man to a white man, yes. which makes it <laughs> even, even more about. interesting, eh? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, yeah, I'm, I just, I, I feel like I need to defer to Sun Chen Ran and his book, uh, Lament, uh, and how, what? Oh, you're reading that book. And uh, uh, it's, it, there's no straight passage from being on the wrong side of worldly power to being on the power of God without a passageway through repentance. Now, this is the good news of the gospel. I mean, is, it, is the world, can we change the world? I think a lot of us are trying to change the world today without the gospel. And it's not going to happen. We need the gospel. Uh, those of us who have been part of a heritage and a history of racism must acknowledge it, receive it, uh, receive ownership of it, and go through lament and confession. I have so many friends who are leading us through this, us white people through this kind of thing. And uh, so they're, they're the ones leading me. I don't really want to lead anybody in this. I just want to follow. Hi, thank you again to echo what Cliff has uh, already given thanks for. My question for you is, well, my ministry is in youth, youth ministry. And so I was wondering, how would you bring up this conversation or begin to bring up this conversation with a junior high boy at eight, in eighth grade or a high school senior? Yeah, and, and so they would be asking what kind of questions? Well, they, well, and I don't know if they would even be asking these kind of questions. And so I wonder, because of maybe the system we're already in, it's already assumed that they have no power. And a lot of ministries, I think, are called next generation, next generation, as in your time has yet to come. And so there might be a feeling of, well, what can I really do? It just seems so large. And I think that's an issue. What a lot can of I do things. in relation to the injustice in the world? It just seems so large. Is that... Yeah, I mean, I think that, yeah, it rolls into yeah, that, ultimately. Yeah. Um, well, uh, at first, so I have a 15-year-old. He'll be 15 in another week, and uh, uh, he's in public school, and uh, he hears the narratives of the church all the time. Uh, and, and to some extent, it's, it's outright shame to even admit you are a Christian these days because of this history. Um, and, and all I... All I uh, try to do with him is show him the spaces and the places where God has worked through the church and the disobedience and rebellion of the church where, where we have been complicit with the evils of culture. Um, and that's part of what I'm trying to do is tell that story because uh, it's so many places. Tonight I'm going to go through about There's amazing stories of what God has done in and through the church covered over by the evils uh, in the history of the church. Um, and then the, the last thing I was going to say to you is, um, I just don't think we have a full understanding about the presence of God and how it works in the world. We have no imagination for that. Tonight I'm going to talk a little bit, I think I'm going to talk a little bit about Charles Taylor and the imminent frame and how we've taken the reality of how God works out of the world. And so our kids have no imagination for that. And they can't enter into what God wants to do and how he wants to use them. And they only see power working one way. And, and I try to cover the TV up yeah. whenever you know who is on the TV. But it's polluting our whole culture. And so the church has got to call 
the youth back to understanding the history and the way God works through his presence. Okay, um, thank you for your lecture tonight. And you said something that really resonated to me about the lament, because we were dealing with racism and lamenting. And, um, but I like when you say repent, you know, repent because it, it just acknowledge, because some people carry the burden and like you said, they're embarrassed. But it's just like, acknowledge it and repent because just that action is a breaking of that spirit that has been over our country. And here in seminary, we've been having these conversations, which has been a blessing, you know, that the conversation is being had. And sometimes it starts before it gets out and it becomes the big revival within the church is what, what we're seeking and praying for, just that repentance to see things change in our land. So just like tonight when he was like, I'm, spirit, I'm feeling the spirit move, but without taking that lightly, you know, we're here and we're a very diverse group of people. And as Christians, we wanna see the move of God. You know, so when you say the presence and feeling it, you know, sensing something in the presence, that's what it's going to take, you know, to see a move in our country and around the world. Um, so I just thank you for just saying that, you know, repent, because it's a lot of repentance that needs to be made in our country amongst the Christians um, overall. However, so thank you. Uh, there's a guy at our school. Uh, he's from Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, uh, John Perkins, a civ famous civil rights leader in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, uh, part of uh, uh, Christian Community Development Association. And uh, um, he says uh, racism is uh, satanic. And uh, you can't stop something satanic without a supernatural force. And so we need more than just, I mean, we do need, don't get me wrong, I, tonight I'm going to go into how government functions in certain ways to accomplish certain things, but it's very minimal. If we're going to, if God's gonna uh, unwind the antagonisms and the evils of racism, it's gonna take the church in the presence of God. And I, my question was, could you repeat what um, parentally stuck, the church is parentally stuck? Could you repeat that? Was it a rift or was it something I was reading? I think it was something you were reading. Mm. I'm not going to be able to find that. Sorry. Per no, parent per perennially. Perennially. Yeah. Stuck. Yes. I never heard that before. So Perennial, it just means permanently stuck. And I'll tell you right now, <laughs> uh, we are stuck. <laughs> but Thank you. I'm already sensing something good here, getting, being unstuck. So praise the Lord for Azusa. What can we do with, you know, the question about youth kind of brought this to my mind. You know, our society now today is, is so much about power and having material things to gain that power. And it's not just in the church, but also in society. But how do you get around being on the right side or the wrong side yeah. of power when that's what our society is about? Yeah. Um, so tonight, six o'clock, <laughs> same time. Um, one of my, one of the th things that's pressing in on me is that uh, our culture, our churches, the way we run our churches, um, the way we think about God, is devoid of the power of His presence at work in social situations, social systems. So if we have no imagination for how God can work any other way, we default into uh, uh, human worldly forms of power. The, I'm going to go through a litany of ways that theologians do this. They flatten out power. Um, saying that, yes, there's a spiritual power at work in our lives, the Holy Spirit's at work, but it's only an individual personal thing. You know, not, not there's anything wrong with that. I consider myself a Pentecostal, okay? But no, actually the presence of God is at work uh, in and among a people. Manifest presence happens in a social body. God is at work everywhere, but where his people come together and submit to his authority, 
power is released. I want to go into that. And we don't have that imagination anymore. You know, uh, real presence, sacramental presence, uh, the Roman Catholics kind of narrowed it down into the bread and the cup. And they said, you know, transubstantiation or some big word like that. That's where the presence is. It's there. We, we found it and we've controlled it. And the priest is in charge. I, I, by the way, I, I hesitate to take on the Roman Catholics too much because uh, a lot of good stuff there too. Okay, so sorry for that, Roman Catholics. Sorry, I didn't mean to... I just was making a rhetorical point. But anyways, the uh, Pentecostals turned ex the power and the presence of Jesus as a personal experience. This is the modern kind of epistemological move. Do I feel it? Yes! That's the Holy Spirit, and he can empower my own personal sanctification. Anabaptists said, oh, yes, yes to that, but it's, he's present in this social arena. He's working among us. If you read the New Testament with that eye, I think you see it all the time. We need a new imagination for the way the presence of God works among a people, in and through the church, and as we carry it out into the world. I have four great examples of this changing the world tonight at 6 o'clock. <laughs> so, Don Thorson, I like the idea, the sociological concept of in bourgeoisie meant. Uh, I've heard that a long time with the Free Methodist Church. Lost their roots, became rich. Yes. Uh, happens to individuals when they're young. Yes. They're, they understand poverty, especially students. As they get older, personal peace and affluence yes. uh, dulls that, 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 that kind of uh, identification and concern and, and advocacy on behalf of the poor. And uh, even at Azu Pacific, you know, I think we have many times lost our roots, uh, the reason why we came into existence. And so one of the ways of overcoming that is remembering back, and of course that's a big theme in the Bible. Remember yes. the the patriarchs, how this all got started. Because when you lose sight of how you got started, you can become you can succumb to a bourgeoisie man. Yes. Yes, that was great. Um, Jamar Tisby talked about greed as one of the colors, right, of compromise, green, and um, about how though you might have conviction. Um, it, it, it the, all that doesn't matter when in if it dents your purse, right? Um, and so, so you know, like Princeton Theological Seminary, where you, we, what you mentioned, um, Hodge and Warfield. You know, I went there, and I, I couldn't. Ex there is, there is this like structural deep in the bones in the groundwater. This there is this sense of stronghold because I think uh, its roots in slavery. Mm. Right, and so they have made uh, efforts for reparations, and it's a an attempt to re for repentance to have a financial impact, um, because uh, you're you're talking about power and power and money have such a correlation, yes. and so is there hope for institutions steeped in history, for example, of slavery or of these oppressive um, century-long iniquities, if you might want to call it that. Is, is there something that can be done when institutions have taken money, um, endowments and such, that enable institutions to thrive and to give scholarships and to support so many things? It seems a little bit tricky because I think, you know, I think about in seminary and seminaries are in need of financial help, and there's donors out there. And so we need donors, and yet, Money is a, a com complex thing. Is it clean? Can you get clean money? Um, so I, I guess my question is, is, there even, is it possible to be um, like a big church, a, 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 a big financially healthy, robust institution on the books and to be not complicit in the wrong side of power? <laughs> I, you know, uh, I, I have seen, I, I, I don't know, I got three or four comments. I don't know if any of them are going to help. 
uh, I have seen people leave behind riches for the gospel. It's beautiful. It doesn't happen a lot, though. It has such a hold. It's amazing to hold. So I would say it's possible. Second thing is, I have seen this problem of money and power everywhere, not just with white people where it came from, but a lot of other minorities who want the same power white people have, money, wealth, affluence. I want that! And they fall into the same trap, and who am I as a white man to say, uh, not a good idea. So we have all those sociodynamics that work against uh, what God wants to do among the poor. The last comment I have is, things are going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> Christendom is falling apart. All our institutions are having to sell off their land. They are becoming poor again. <laughs> maybe, maybe there is hope after all, one way or another, that God will spring a renewal out of this whole mess we're in right now. This was both uh, sobering and hopeful, ho hopeful in the sense that you've reminded us that the Spirit of God is still at work, but just maybe not in the places we expect, right? So maybe, maybe not in the places that get all the attention, but some of the places that we don't even know about. Like God, God can be up to something, and we, we have yet to see it. The seeds are planted. So thank you for that hope, but thank you for the sobering message as well. I want to close us in prayer, and then we'll be finished for now. And um, Lord, you are the, the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords, and yet the way that you have led with a basin and a towel, with a, a, a cross, among the disenfranchised is, is a challenge for us, a challenge that we attempt to embrace. And so help us as, as followers, help us as uh, leaders in the church to understand what true leadership means in the sense of Jesus kind of leadership and to, to resist the temptation that, that pulls us, that, that draws us, that sucks us in to the other, the other ways of leading that become so attractive and familiar to us. Lord, I'm encouraged by this group and the students here and the professors that are here, and we believe that you're up to something, and we, we encourage that and embrace that. So thank you, and thank you for David. Thank you for his voice today. Thank you for the message that you've laid on his heart, we continue to ask that you uh, it, it rumble around inside of us until, until you're finished with it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.